Okay, well, hello and welcome today. My name is Ken Melendez, and with me I have special guest Andrew Arkey today. Uh, we're going to be doing kind of a little interview, a uh, little history lesson here on Steam and Steam at Inc. Um, basically, what I'm going to be, uh, one of the reasons that I'm making these types of videos is because I'm going to be actually creating a, a book about Steam uh, and kind of diving into not only the history, but kind of how people can get involved from like an entrepreneurial type uh, level and just exploring those avenues and basically getting steam out to the masses um, so that as many eyeballs can see it as possible. And so what I want to do is just gather information um, from people at Steam Inc., uh, other, you know, big influencers as well who, you know, are in the blockchain space, who are living it day to day. And so I'm really excited to have Andrarka here uh, with me today. So thank you so much for, for coming on today. Yeah, my pleasure. I think Tim Cliff would be another great guest for you because he's just been around for so long. He's a community member and uh, I would say a leading expert in the world on the Steam back dollar. So he's my recommendation for the next one. Uh, yeah, I have seen Tim Cliff in the community. So yeah, I'll definitely be, uh, you know, contacting him as well. So and great. an all around just great person. Oh, awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to meeting him too. So thank you for that. Um, but yeah, maybe if you could just t tell us a little bit about uh, kind of what you do at Steemit um, as a director of communications. That's kind of your, your new title. Yeah, technically it's head of communications oh, and of communication. advocacy. And advocacy. <laughs> Don't forget the advocacy part. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I, for a while I was the content director. Before that, I was the community liaison. But throughout... Throughout my tenure, it's really been about content creation. Mm -hmm. That's been the majority of what I did, even as community liaison, because it's a content platform. Yeah. And, and I'm a content creator. And so even though my responsibilities and the level of authority that I've been given has kind of changed throughout my time at Steemit, it's still mostly about content and that's how I kind of look at my role as head of communications. What's being added is, uh, is I think the internal communications part, which is really interesting and fun and trying to make sure that the team is communicating well internally and supporting the team members because engineers aren't always the best communicators that I don't mean that as a knock, but I really love the people that I work with. Um, but you know, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. And so it's nice to be able to get in there and kind of facilitate communications b between teams, between engineers. Sometimes it's just as simple as setting up a meeting with people or, or being part of a meeting and just helping the discussion kind of stay focused, stuff like that. Um, and then I try to look at what we're doing internally and how we can convert that into external communication so that people can get better insight into what we're doing. But at the end of the day, it's, it's really content. And even with respect to internal communications, like I did an article recently about dog fooding and the importance of dog fooding and why it was important that Steemit team members be able to accept rewards. But that article and the video that went along with it were as much about communicating with the community as it was about communicating with the team and basically saying to them, it's okay for you to accept rewards. And here's why it's important for you to accept rewards because you need to create content and you need to communicate directly with users and you need to have direct feedback with the product itself and rewards are an important part of that product. So let's do it. Uh, so, so that's really what, what I'm trying to do now. And I'm trying to explore other opportunities to work with community members. I really want our communication strategy to be community led in many ways, especially with respect to external communications. How are we communicating with the world? Uh, how, how are we spreading the word about Steam and steamit.com and all the other great apps that are leveraging steam because steam is at the core of it all we're all steam stakeholders so what benefits steam benefits all of us and i think that having that message um communicated by the community is going to be 10 times more powerful 
than just us communicating it and with our limited people, our limited resources, and our conflict. Of course, we're going to think steamit.com is great and the Steam blockchain is great. We make it. Um, I wouldn't blame anybody for holding that view, but if it's our community members who are explaining why they love the Steam blockchain and why they love steamit.com, it's going to be a much more powerful message. So that's really what I'm working on right now. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, and you're going to be at the Global Block Builders Conference coming up here next month in Austin, um, which is awesome too. I'm going to be there as well. Um, what are you uh, kind of excited about to see maybe happen there while, while you're down there? I'm, I'm, I'm most excited about the, the shift that's happening towards thinking about entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and changing the focus to entrepreneurship. The biggest gap that we seem to have in the blockchain sector as a whole is you've got lots of developers and you've got almost no marketers and no entrepreneurs. And I think Steam has a huge competitive advantage in those specific areas because we do have marketers and we do have entrepreneurs mm -hmm. because Steam has a, a magical property of turning every engineer and every, every content creator and every curator into an entrepreneur, but they're not advanced entrepreneurs and marketers. They're, we're all new at this. We're all learning as we go. The magical part of Steam is that you can get paid to learn as you're learning, as you're creating content, as you're building your business. I was talking to the Oracle D guys about this, and I hope to put out a, a, a podcast and a video cast about this soon. Um, but they talked about how they were, they, they were able to self-fund as they launched their MVPs because they built on Steam. And so... While that's extremely powerful, we need to keep learning and we need to keep growing. And until we are able, the, our, the products and services, Steam will only be as valuable as the products and services that leverage it. And the products and services that leverage Steam will only be as successful as the teams that build it. And those teams have to have business, uh, business marketing and product. And they need to be, and the higher level that they are, the better those, those teams are, the more valuable the application will become, and the more valuable the protocol that powers it will, be, will become. I mean, imagine Steve Jobs was building on Steam. Do you, you know, like, would his products and services be worth more or less than the products and services we're offering now? And I'm not saying that none of the people on Steam right now are, aren't capable of becoming Steve Jobs level marketers and entrepreneurs, but I will say that none of them are there now. And so that's what's exciting to me about the angle that this conference is going, is it seems much, it's very open, it's open to different blockchain projects, it, it's open to different companies that may, maybe aren't even blockchain companies, so we can all come together and, and become better entrepreneurs. Yeah, that's awesome because that's definitely what my book encompasses too is just about that entrepreneurial angle and, you know, having that business sense and that marketing sense and, and really, you know, making Steam bigger. That's really what it's, it's about, making the whole Steam it bigger, making Steam bigger, making blockchain bigger and just getting it out to a huge, you know, massive audience. So Yeah, we can make this thing whatever we want it to be. That's what open source means. Open source means that if, if you build the code, that will be the code. And we're in a very unique uh, uh, position as Steam community members where we have resources and interfaces that enable us as ordinary people, as non-engineers, to influence the direction of this thing. And if we make it huge and we make it great for content creators and curators and entrepreneurs and app developers mm -hmm. and there's no limit on what it can become aside from our imaginations and our talent. Awesome. So yeah, uh, can you tell me kind of a little bit about uh, like the Steemit history, um, kind of how it all got started, um, you know, different people involved and, and kind of where it's come, you know, since the, the beginning. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I only, I started on the team about six months after the app and the blockchain launched. I joined steamit.com about a month after it launched and well before payouts even really started up until July 4th of 2016, all payouts were pending. And I recently learned that the reason for that was largely marketing. Payouts could have started immediately, which is part of what always confused me, but I was recently talking to Nanette about it at our, at our all team meeting about two weeks ago. And, and he explained to me that the reason was that they thought it would be more exciting to have it build up. You'd have all these rewards build up and, and all the payouts would be pending. And then on July 4th, the independence day, everybody would get these tokens. And it was a really interesting time because I was just super excited by the technology and the capabilities of it. And it all sounded like it made sense to me. I studied the white paper pretty aggressively. All the engineers who were looking at it seemed to think it would work, but there's a lot of people, especially out there, people not using the platform, which is interesting, right? It's always people who don't use the platform who want to criticize the platform. Uh, but, you know, saying, ah, it's, it's, it's BS. Those payouts aren't going to come. And then of course, July 4th comes and the payouts start, start coming out. And then it's like, well, you know, the people who like FUD, they just move on to some other complaint. And uh, like Tesla Motors is the perfect proof of that, right? Like Elon Musk says that the goal of Tesla is to launch a $35,000 car and 10 years later, they launch a 30, you know, and all along the way they're saying, okay, well you did this, but you're not gonna be able to do that. You did that, but you're not gonna be able to do this. You did that, but you're not gonna be able to launch a $35,000 car. They launch the $35,000 car and they go, they're really rushing this $35,000 car because sales aren't there or some made up new thing. And we've seen that time and time again with, with Steam It and Steam. So, um, so, so I, joined, I, I joined the platform about a month in, but I studied everything that was going on and that's still pretty early. And just the other week at that all team meeting, I got to speak with Vandenberg, who's our lead blockchain developer, and who, he was an early member of the team, and, and he give, gave me a little bit of backstory. Uh, so I had known that the predecessor to Steam was BitShares, and that's really where things started for Steam and Steam at the, and Steam at the company, because that's what Dan Larimer worked on before he worked on Steam. And I think the key innovation that Dan came up with was delegated proof of stake. Still looking back on it, you can say that, that was the major contribution. And, and Ned found, Ned Scott, the CEO and founder of Steemit, he found Dan because I think they, we, we all love Bitcoin. I mean, obviously, like we're all big blockchain advocates. We love Bitcoin. We love all, all blockchain projects. We think that, that Steam offers far more potential than most other blockchains. I mean, Bitcoin is Bitcoin. It's digital gold. You're like, that's not, that's not even remotely what we're going after. We're, we're going after web applications. We're going after micro payments. We're going after social applications. And, uh, but what we've learned through things like steam monsters, through things like drug wars, is that if you make these core smart contracts that are integrated into steam, that are hard coded into steam, if you pick the right ones, which we believe we have, and then you add the extra layer of customizability that comes through custom JSON operations, that you can build any application, uh, any decentralized application that's fast, it's free to use for users and delivers just an amazing user experience. So we love Bitcoin and Ned loved Bitcoin and I'm sure Dan did too. I've never spoken to him about it, but they were, I assume that they were trying to figure out what to do next. And I think that the clue is in the title of BitShares 
So it's like Bitcoin, but it's also like shares. And so what they did was Dan's key innovation was delegated proof of stake and basically saying part of the complexity and cost and difficulty of Bitcoin is around proof of work and the degree of decentralization. You've got all of these people performing meaningless computations, competing with one another, not to render any kind of useful service, but the useful service is securing the network through proof of work. And he said, well, what if we shrunk the number of nodes to a kind of minimal number of nodes necessary to secure the network so that we get efficiency increases while maintaining the security? And they settled on 20 block producers, plus one random block producers. At least that's how Steam works. I think BitShares might be a little different, but it's essentially the same. It's around 20 block producers who are elected in. It's proof of stake, not proof of work. So you don't have all of that uh, compu computational overhead being integrated into the network and, and the costs of performing those functions being uh, borne by the network. And, uh, and Depos does this, does a round robin thing. So the blocks are produced regularly. So witnesses produce blocks every three seconds. And then they, they wanted to, so they, they, he, that was the key innovation. And then, then I think the question became, well, what do we do with this? And the first implementation was bit shares. And, and so I think from the beginning, the idea was a very fast blockchain leveraging these this smaller number of nodes and the efficiency that comes from that to deliver a much faster blockchain and then delivering an additional value proposition that nothing else offered including bitcoin and so the idea was well what if you could create other assets uh, and that's what bitshares did and then graphene was the database technology that I believe Dan architected to uh, support that blockchain. And, uh, and I think, and, and they had reasonable success with BitShares. Cryptonomics was the company that I believe was started by Dan and his father, Stan. And they launched BitShares. And you can think of BitShares really as a, a really good test case for Steam. And I think that Really, as far as blockchain is concerned, the I think an important lesson that we've learned is that it's really important to iterate and it's really important to introduce solutions that will enable you to learn when you implement your next solution. And we do we still do that at Steemit on different levels. And so I think one of the reasons that Steam and Steemit have managed to survive in a very difficult landscape is because there was a learning experience from BitShares. And so Ned, who was into Bitcoin and wanted to know what the next thing was, found BitShares and found Dan, and I, I believe moved down to Virginia to explore what, where he might be able to fit in and what they might be able to do together. And I think, during that process, cryptonomics started to have some financial difficulties. BitShares wasn't doing well enough. Uh, the the BitShares token that tokens that they held weren't capable of supporting a company. Now BitShares is still around. It's still a high market cap token. People are still using it. People are are still issuing assets on it. And I think it's a credit to the people who created it, the people who maintain it, that that it's still there and it's still delivering tremendous value. But but I believe that cryptonomics wasn't able to survive. And so during this transitional period where this company was really struggling to figure out what it would do next, Ned and Dan were talking and, and, and trying to figure out what they would do next. Because the cool thing about blockchains and decentralized blockchains and open source protocols is that once you release them and once you have some kind of, uh, once you reach a critical mass of a community of developers, they tend to run on their own. And so you can start thinking about what you're going to do next. 
And uh, especially if the model that you're working under now isn't doing well. And so the idea, from what I understand, I wasn't there, but from what I've heard, Dan wanted to pursue a, Dan's idea for the next thing was a mutual aid society, which was basically an open and decentralized insurance organization. And uh, maybe he would have called it a DAC, a decentralized autonomous corporation. And the idea was that you would upload insurance claims to the blockchain and then people, other users would upvote or downvote that claim based on how legitimate they thought it was. And if it got enough upvotes, the claim would get paid out. And knowing Ned and what a big fan of Reddit he is, I think what happened next was that Ned was like, and, and, and I, from what I understand, Ned took it in the direction of the, of the social app, uh, a much more Reddit-like app. And I think he was like, well, if we're uploading content and people are upvoting and downvoting it, why don't, why don't we just let them share whatever content they want, like Reddit, and, uh, and that might have a much broader uh, market. And, and, and then I guess they agreed on that, uh, agreed that that was the right next step. And then, then the process began of folding cryptonomics and its intellectual property, which it used to create bid shares into Steemit Inc. And, uh, and, and Ned became the CEO of that company. And then they, they began hiring people. They hired one of their first hires was Vandenberg, who's now our lead blockchain developer. And he was, he responded, he was at grad school, I believe, in, he, he was at grad school in Virginia, interested in getting in, into blockchain, interested in getting his hands dirty, top, bored of the academic life. And he responded to a classified ad uh, for an internship. and. He showed up and asked if they could do full-time work for him, and they said yes. And so he left grad school, started working full-time at what was then Cryptonomics, and got folded into Steemit and began testing the Steam blockchain before it was rolled out. Hmm. Wow, that's, that's and that, that <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's that's uh, uh, basically what I know about the formation of 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 Steam and, and Steam at Inc.